Hey, this is Joel Duff. Welcome back to my channel. And today, yeah, I'm just talking some stuff. We're, we're going to look at some original research, right? Original research article. And we're just going to see what we can learn from it. And I like to pick research articles that are not like flashy ones or like like these turned into headlines anywhere. <laughs> like most of you would never have heard of this. They're kind of like, hey, there's millions of organisms out there. There's a lot of people that work on all kinds of little interesting details about them. But I'm going to try to make what they have found about these particular organisms, the organ pipe cactus. Uh, we're going to look at genetic diversity and gene flow in organ pipe cacti. And I'm going to relate it to some bigger issues, some bigger topics. All right. So before I dig into the actual research article, uh, let me just show you some pictures of organ pipe cacti so that you have an image in your mind because there's not going to be too many images in the paper itself. Actually, no images of the cacti itself. Um, this is an organ. Well, my family here, some of my family are standing in uh, organ pipe National Monument, which is in the very southern portion of Arizona, right on the border with Mexico. And there, uh, there's a large number of organ pipe cacti uh, in a preserve. And uh, in fact, this is, you can find organ pipe cacti a little bit farther north and in other areas of the Sonoran Desert in southern Arizona. Um, but it's pretty much at the northern, what we call the northern extent of its geographical boundary, right, or its niche. Uh, organ pipe cactus is a, a particular species, as we're going to find out. There's a whole bunch of species of Stenoceros, the genus. This particular species is called the organ pipe cactus, but there's a bunch of other columnar cacti that are very similar to the organ pipe cacti. And they live in generally in central Mexico and northern uh, Mexico and the Baja Peninsula. So a really large cactus. Uh, not everything in this picture is an organ pipe cactus. You can see off to the side here, there's a saguaro. Uh, in fact, most of the other large poles that are sticking straight up are saguaro cacti. Uh, and of course, there's saguaro National Park, uh, not too far away from, from where, we're, where we're standing here. Yeah, a few more pictures. Again, saguaro and organ pipe cacti. Now, saguaro are a different genus, uh, and they're in a different uh, subgroup, I believe, of cacti. Well, well, we'll see that, because I'm going to show you the phylogeny, how all the different cacti are related to one another uh, in different groups. And I'll show you the columnar cacti, and saguaro are a type of columnar uh, cacti as well. By the way, Sonoran Desert is just awesome. Uh, you know, it's like when you think of deserts and you think of like, okay, like Death Valley or the Sahara or something like that, and you think of like very little vegetation. The Sonoran Desert has a huge amount of vegetation and more importantly, has a, a huge amount of diverse vegetation. Uh, everything has spines, thorns, and prickles on it, but they're not all cacti. All right? The Cactaceae is a family of several thousand, I think it's like at least 3,000 different species of organisms that are bound by a number of characteristics, not just their spines, uh, but they have a floral features that are that, that are in common. So really, there's only two cacti that I see in this picture. Uh, and that's there's a saguaro hiding behind this uh, shrub over here. And then there's these columnar uh, cacti or sorry, the organ pipe cactus. Here we are walking through. Uh, this is in January and it was like 94 degrees there. Uh, yeah, great place to visit in, uh, in January when you're from Ohio. Okay, so you've got an organ pipe cactus in your mind now, right? This is what an organ pipe cactus looks like. We're going to talk about its distribution and a whole bunch of other features in just a moment when we look at the paper. Okay, we're not going straight to the paper yet. I'm going to do what I've done many times before when I introduce these papers. I said, how did I find this particular paper? Was it that I have a keen interest in um, organ pipe cactus? Not necessarily. I mean, I think they're really cool plants and we saw them and I was interested in them. I knew what they were. Uh, but what the way I bumped into this particular paper is that as a research scientist, I have a number of different journals that I scan through and look at uh, on a fairly regular basis. And I kind of like want, want to know what's the most recent thing that's come out. I also use Twitter or <laughs> that X thing. I don't even know what to call it anymore. Uh, and other social media to help funnel 
uh, interesting papers to me too, right? So I follow a number of different journals and they tell me what's come out and you know, you get the simple bullet point of what the topic is. And if I'm interested in it, then I will pursue that a little bit further. But here I like to go to a journal like PLOS One and I have browsed to the paleontological section and I've just said, hey, I want to see all the all the articles on paleontology, and I've sorted them by most recent. And so, what's the most recent thing that's come out? All right, how can past sea level be evaluated from traces of anthropogenic layers in ancient salt pans? Eh, I, I'm not interested enough to look at that. Double pointed wooden throwing stick from Germany results in new insights from multi analytic studies. Eh, I'll pass on that. Multidisciplinary analysis of 11th and 12th century bronze doors of San Marco, Venice. Nope, probably not interested in that one either. I mean, there's thousands of articles, <laughs> there's seemingly thousands that come out every week. All right, and so I gotta be a little bit discriminating. And let's scroll down here. Uh, phylogenetic relationships among Mexican phlebotomine sand flies. All right. What do I do? I want to know about all the different types of sand flies uh, and their divergence time estimation. So what are the relationships? This is probably uh, sequencing a bunch of, of DNA from a bunch of different sand fly species and then looking at how similar they are and making decisions about their relatedness, putting them into this is generally how classification is done in a lot of groups now, putting them into groups of similarities that represent the different genera and families and so forth. And then they're also using probably the molecular clock. I mean, I've not even opened this article, right? I, I've not looked at it. I'm just telling you what I think is probably in it. Um, and they've used those DNA sequences and used uh, neutral sites, meaning that these are mutations, uh, places where there's genetic variation between the individual sand flies that appear to be at neutral locations, so aren't under the under selective pressure. And those neutral sites should be uh, accumulating in different species uh, at a fairly even rate over time, right? After each generation, you add some new mutations and you do that at a relatively even pace. And therefore, you can, do, you can apply what's called the molecular clock, which is an estimation of how long it's been since two different species diverged from a common ancestor due to the amount of accumulation of neutral mutations they have. And from that, therefore, you can make divergence time estimates for all the different groups or branches in your phylogeny. Sorry, I had no idea I was going to go into that tangent, but there you go. I'm, I'm basically telling you what's in that paper without actually opening that paper. Um, I'm not interested enough in sand flies to actually care about the timing. Um, I'm sure we could look at that and talk about how that relates to um, uh, young earth creationism or some other model of how they would understand how these things are organized and related and how old they are but it's not worth it but we are going to look at this next paper which you're probably like eh, this one's probably no more interesting either but i did find this one interesting and I, actually the title caught my attention uh, and as we go through the paper you'll see why are 150 kilometers of open sea enough gene flow and population differentiation differentiation in a bat pollinated columnar cactus and i could see where the cactus was from which was right here in southern one of the sites was in southern arizona and i thought columnar cactus it could only be talking about one of two things if we're uh, in arizona which would be um uh, would be the uh, uh, saguaros um or the organ pipe cactus. It just hit me, I think, in the introduction. I, I possibly might have called a saguaro a Joshua tree. Apologize if, if I did that. I, I already can't remember what I called them. But they're Joshua trees, um, but those are not cacti. Those are a type of yucca plant. Uh, and they're found more in California and uh, the very western part of Arizona. So let's go to the paper. Let's take a look. I'm just going to read some highlights from the paper and explain what I think the significance is of them. Like, why did they study columnar cactus? Why would anyone be interested in that? Why did they look at columnar cactus from the Baja Peninsula versus the mainland of, of North America or Central, North Central America in Mexico? All right, here we are. Are 150 kilometers of open sea enough? Gene flow and population differentiation in a bat pollinated columnar cactus by Sebastian Arenas et al. 
Uh, we're published in the journal PLOS 1. Uh, this is open access, so any of you could access this particular paper. You don't need a, a subscription. And actually, that's true for all PLOS 1 articles. It's one of the reasons I'm using these articles is so that um, they're not going to be behind the paywall for anyone who's interested in checking up on what I've said. Uh, all right, let's read the abstract because that's going to give us an idea, right, of what this paper is about, what they found, but also a little snapshot of the significance of it. Genetic differentiation uh, or genetic differentiations and phylogeographic patterns are controlled by the interplay between spatial isolation and gene flow. Right, so let me unpack what that sentence is telling you because this is, this is a, a very compact sentence that says a lot because it's telling you about the, uh, the basic concept uh, from evolutionary biology that then they're going to be exploring, right? So gene genetic differentiations, genetic differentiation would just be if you have a population of organisms, you can have genetic differentiation within a population. So like even within an area where you have a whole bunch of individuals, you might see patterns. If you looked at all those individuals' genetics, you might see patterns where some individuals in one part of the population uh, have different allele frequencies, uh, different genes versus another part of that population. And so you'd, you'd have a, a non-uniform distribution of alleles of genetic variation within a population. That's interesting. And you can talk about why that might be the case. How did that come to be? But more likely and more often we're talking about genetic differentiation with say a species and a species has multiple populations so there's populations of this organ pipe cactus in different locations in mexico and you can go to those populations and get an idea of what the population genetic variation is in that population and then go to another population and if there are differences between the types of alleles the different variants that are in those populations and the frequencies of those variants in different populations then you would say that there are genetic you know that those populations have genetic variation they're they're differentiated uh all right so that's the first uh, set of words there and then phylogeographic patterns um phylogeographic patterns would be you got a bunch of populations and each one of those populations, maybe you've characterized genetically, looking at their variation. Uh, and phylogeography would be, okay, you've got uh, many different populations, and those are in different geographical places. So what's the phylogeographic pattern? The phylogeographic pattern, phylogeny refers to like relationships or connections between different populations. You might look at a bunch of populations and go like, oh, you know what? Those two populations are more similar to one another. They seem to be connected to one another by gene flow there seems to be genetic connections between these three populations over here and then over here there's some other populations and they're connected to each other and then up here there's some other populations that are more connected to each other and that would be a pattern but that's not the only pattern possible right another pattern possible would be like there's three populations over here but one population is more similar to the population that's way far away and then how would you explain that well well, there must be some kind of gene flow connection between these two populations to the exclusion of the other populations. That's a really interesting pattern. They're much more interesting. It's a less expected pattern. And when you get a, a less expected pattern, all right, then that becomes more intriguing. You know, like I need an explanation for why that's the curve because it's pretty easy to explain why populations that are close together are more similar to another, right? Because they're close together, they're more likely to be pollinated by this by individuals between them, or seeds might be moved back and forth between them, and that's mixing their gene pool and therefore reducing the amount of what genetic differentiation that you observe between those populations. In other words, they look they look like they're connected. That's the phylogeographic pattern. Um, and what controls geographical genetic differentiations and phylogenetic patterns? the interplay between spatial isolation, right? There's spatial isolation, which can occur within populations. And then there's spatial isolation, obviously between populations, they're geographically isolated. And how much gene flow there is. There could be populations or individuals even within a population that are spatially fairly close together and yet they might not have any gene flow. There's nothing that connects them. They never interbreed with one another. Right? So they have a lack of gene flow. And that would result in genetic differentiation. 
you could have two populations that are far away, and yet if they have a particular pollinator, like a bat, like in this case, <laughs> if they have a bat which has a population that then migrates from one place to another fairly frequently, and it's going to then draw make a connection between the things it pollinates in those two different locations, and therefore genetically creates a connection between those maybe what are distant populations from one another. Uh, and so the amount of gene flow and the spatial isolation are the interplay between those two results in the patterns of genetic differentiation and phylogeo phylogeographic patterns that we see today uh, amongst organisms. So what we're going to see in this particular paper, yes, I've spent a lot of time on the first sentence, and trust me, we're, we're going to fly through the rest of it. <laughs> Uh, my dogs bother me, so I got, I'm got i completely distracted. I forgot where I was, but I think that I finished the first sentence. All right, but I think we've, we've wrapped up the first sentence, so let's move on to the second sentence. To assess the extent of gene flow across an oceanic barrier. So we're going to drill down now. We're interested in a specific situation, a situation where um, there's an oceanic barrier between individual populations, and how much does that stop gene flow? How much does that stop the passing back and forth of genetic information. We explored the effect of separation on the peninsula uh, of the peninsula of Baja California on the evolution of mainland and peninsular populations of the long-lived columnar cactus Stenoceros thurbii. Uh, sorry, yeah, thurbii. That's the organ pipe cactus. We analyzed 12 populations throughout the organ pipe cactus distribution range to assess genetic diversity. How much diversity was there in individual populations and structure using chloroplast DNA sequences. So they're going to sequence, get individual nucleotide sequences from the chloroplast genome. So they go in, they actually just target a few genes from the chloroplast genome, pull out those genes using PCR and amplification process, and then they sequence those and then they just line up those sequences and they look at differences between those sequences within the populations. Okay. There's a lot of statistics, uh, a lot of numbers in this particular paper. We're not going to be talking about the derivation of these numbers. We're not going to be talking about, uh, and I'm not going to be talking about all the numbers. I just want to hit a few essential highlights. So I'm going to very roughly go over this in some of the, the other data that's in here. Genetic diversity was higher in mainland populations versus peninsular populations. So more genetic diversity, more different types of alleles uh, in the mainland populations than there were in the peninsula populations. And then how that, how that uh, those alleles are ordered within populations were also different between those two populations. Two mainland and one peninsular ancestral haplotypes were reconstructed. Two mainland and one peninsular ancestral haplotype were reconstructed. That's why I'm saying, like, if we look at all these populations, we looked at all 12 populations, and we kind of grouped them together and asked ourselves what would be the sort of the core or average um, type of distribution of alleles, right? Numbers of different alleles in different population groups. And they say like, well, we ended up with sort of like, there's like all the peninsular populations we looked at, we could group into one group. And then on the mainland, we found sort of like two groups where these populations shared these alleles. Maybe these, there's some rare alleles in there that are not found in the other group of population. This other group of populations has a, another set of alleles not found in the other population. So we ended up with sort of like three groups of populations in that sense. Uh, of one of which was on the peninsula and two in the mainland. The peninsular populations were as isolated among them as with mainland populations. The peninsula haplotypes formed a group with one mainland coastal population, and populations across the Gulf shared common haplotypes. Hmm, so populations across the Gulf, right? had common haplotypes with one of those mainland populations, supporting regular gene flow across the Gulf. 
How would you have similar, say, maybe rare alleles that are in low frequency in one population on the Baja Peninsula, and then several hundred kilometers away have uh, those same rare uh, alleles in other populations on the other side of the Gulf? Right? If those alleles occurred by new mutations in those populations over time, or even if they were shared originally on a, in an ancestral population somewhere else that then diverged into the peninsula and the mainland, they would still have to maintain those alleles in rare frequency. Uh, and what we haven't, what I haven't told you yet is the alleles they're looking at, the, the variants we're going to be talking about, they're all considered to be neutral variants, not under selectional pressure, and so therefore are evolving in a, in, in a random genetic drift fashion. And so you wouldn't expect to have two different populations that are highly isolated if they didn't have gene flow to have the same sort of allele frequency, have the same rare alleles in them. Um, but gene flow explains that. Gene flow is likely mediated by bats, the main pollinators and seed dispersers. That's an observation we make of the world. If we see that they are dispersing, they are pollinating and dispersing seeds. Niche modeling, okay, not a fancy word suggests that during the last glacial maximum 130,000 years ago, um, organ pipe cactus populations shrank to southern locations. In other words, when the, when the glaciers were at their maximum, right, the southern United States was not as hot as it is today, and therefore the niche, all right, the, the environment which is best suited or the organ pipe cactus are adapted to, to surviving it, didn't exist in southern Arizona. All right, it wasn't hot and dry enough, all right, with monsoon rains, which is which is a key to the Sonoran Desert. And so what you had was you had that habitat was pushed farther south into Mexico. All right, and so the original populations or the populations during the last glacial, ma glacial maximum were suggested by modeling to have been much farther south. All right, so but currently Stenoceros thurbii populations are expanding. This is an observation also from watching plants over the last hundred years is that they are moving into new habitats. They are conquering new locations, all right? Their niche is expanding and it's expanding north. Why is it expanding north? Oh, because things are getting hotter, all right? Hotter and drier. And so their particular habitat is actually growing and they're filling, they're moving into that new habitat where they can outcompete other organisms that were more adapted to a slightly wetter, slightly cooler environment before, right? They're being pushed out, they're moving in. Um, ancestral populations are located on the mainland and throughout vicariant peninsula populations cannot, although vicariant pen peninsular populations can't be ruled out. They believe that uh, and they make, uh, I think, an effective argument. The ancestral population, the original population of organ pipe cactus was on the mainland and it has expanded over to the peninsula. Uh, they're likely the result of gene flow across a seemingly formidable barrier of the Gulf of Mexico. Still, unique haplotypes occur on the peninsula and mainland and peninsular populations are more structured than those on the mainland. All right, so even though there are some alleles that cross, in other words, gene flow is occurring but it's not occurring at a very high rate. And because it's not occurring at a high rate, there are new mutations that are occurring on the peninsula and that are entering into that population. And so some of the, the different peninsular populations each have their own unique alleles, unique variants uh, in them that have yet to be distributed across. Why would that, you know, why haven't they been distributed across? I mean, if there is any gene flow, well, for one thing, you know, if there's only, five individuals out of a thousand in a population that have a unique variant, right? A, a little bit of their chloroplast genome with a different variant in it. Uh, when that, uh, when that um, bat takes a seed across from a plant, it has a good chance of not bringing that for a particular variant, right? Because this, that variant has only exist in a very small number of seeds in that population. Or same thing with the pollen, right? If they're transporting the pollen across the, the um, uh, from the Baja Peninsula over to Mexico, they have a very small chance of bringing that particular variant um, with it. Uh, and so that therefore allows those populations to continue to have these rare variants, making them more genetically structured uh, as a result. All right, so that in a, in a nutshell is the paper 
those are the results. So what have they done? Uh, let's look at, uh, well, let me read this first sentence here. The present distribution of species is the consequence of phylogenetic process, phylogeographic processes, ecological interactions, and the events of dispersal and or vicariance. All right, that's just a general statement about why is it the species are distributed the way they are. It's because there's a bunch of different phylogeographic processes that are occurring, right? There's interactions between organisms that influence where they can survive. And there's also changes in the environment. And like I said, because the environment's changing, the columnar cactus uh, is able to move into new locations that weren't there before, which means other ones are leaving. That's also part of the interactions, ecological interactions. Um, and that is a form of dispersal. There's also another form of, of distribution, which is called vicariance. So vicariance would be more like um, if one time the Baja Peninsula wasn't separated from the mainland, right? If, if earthquakes are gradually separating that area, maybe the original population was together and then the land split, all right? And so that's called vicariant um, uh, separation, right, of populations. They're being carried away from one another and separated uh, by that. And so there's a geographical barrier as a result of that. The geographic range of a species might comprise separate populations leading to allopatric speciation. Yeah, I mean, most species are not in a continuous population. They're in some, they're in a large meta population that includes multiple individual populations that are, that may be separated and isolated. That's certainly true for something like this cactus. They live on the, like the south facing slopes of maybe some mountain range, but not on the north facing slopes because of the environmental differences. And then you have to, you go to the next mountain range and then there they are on the south facing slopes of that mountain range. So then there's a large gap between the two where there are no organ pipe cacti. So you can't have continuous, it's, it's difficult to have continuous gene flow between these populations. Obviously the individuals in the same population closer together are going to have pollinators that are helping them pollinate each other close together. That keeps them to be, that keeps them more uniform, right? Because they have a lot of gene flow. But they're not having as much gene flow with the next mountain range over, right? And uh, take any basic intro evolutionary biology course and you would learn that one way that new species form is that if there are geographical barriers like that to gene flow the individuals that are having gene flow can't split into two two species because they're constantly exchanging their genes and therefore they're all genetically similar there's very little genetic structure in that population they all have the same sorts of combinations of genes but that population is farther away that doesn't have gene flow well it is under different environmental influences. There's uh, different ecological conditions there. So in other words, selection is happening differently in those two locations and they have different mutations. And so as they accumulate different mutations, they then derive differences between each other. If those differences never get shared, the two populations inevitably become so different that we'll have one species up there and we'll have another species somewhere else. There are 20 some other species of columnar, uh, of organ pipe like cacti, right? In the Stenoceros genus. Those 20 different species have a lot of similarities to organ pipe cactus, but they are clearly not an organ pipe cactus. However, in the past, they probably were all from a common population that then divided into subpopulations in different locations that then are, are basically, well, didn't basically, they uh, accumulated changes and experienced different conditions and became different species over time. And kind of the question here is, could that be happening to the organ pipe cactus, right? If the ones in the Baja Peninsula are so far away from the other ones in Mexico, maybe they are not having enough gene flow. If they don't have enough gene flow, there could be so much genetic difference between the two accumulating that the organ pipe cacti on the peninsula might become different species someday. Now, what they discovered was, is that actually bats are not doing that bad of a job. They're actually, bats are actually traveling several hundred kilometers across the Gulf of Mexico in a seasonal rotation in which they spend time on one part of the peninsula, then they move across, all right? And so they roost in one area and, and, and have a offspring, and then they move back. So it's like they have two, two seasonal areas. And as a result, because of their moving across, they're actually bringing either pollen or I think in this case, they're, I think they're more arguing as seeds, uh, are being transported across. And then those seeds will grow up into potentially a new organ pipe cactus on the other side 
And then when it reproduces, it reproduces with what? Most likely with its neighbors. And that's how you have gene flow occur. Uh, by the way, I'm actually saying pretty much everything that's in these, these paragraphs. Um, but let me just show you the figure here. So this is the distribution of organ pipe cacti. So the green area represents their preferred habitat. So that's their niche, all right? And they are pretty much distributed within that particular niche. So there, you could look at this and, and uh, somebody could model like where you would expect to find an organ pipe cactus based on where we think the environmental conditions exist that they best live in. And then you can go into the real world and you say like, do they actually live here? And in many cases they don't. Like, you know, I was like, well, here's this valley that has all these different environmental parameters that seem to be good for organ pipe cactus, but they're not there. But they might not be there simply because they haven't gotten there yet, right? That, that, that it just might not be, uh, have been colonized yet. Um, but nonetheless, what the green area here represents is where we've actually observed them. And this is probably their preferred habitat as well. All right, so there you see there are populations on one side of the Gulf of California, and then there's a bunch of populations on the other side of the Gulf of California. And the ones that are up here, right, these are just the ones that are in the, this little area that is a, a national monument in the United States for organ pipe cacti. And that's the only, almost the only place you can see them. I mean, people have them in their yards in Phoenix and so forth, but they're not really native to that particular, uh, particular area. Let's go back up here again. Major forces behind actually shaping, actual shaping of the geographical distribution of species include the movement of land masses through tectonics. Mm, now nah, let's skip this. That's all just explaining vicariance. The evolutionary mechanisms of vicariance and colonization through dispersal shape populations, genetic structure, and led to diversions. However, separating the mechanisms controlling allopatric differentiation is difficult and represents a major challenge in biogeographical bio research. Gene flow acts as a major unifying force holding together a common gene pool. Right? The more gene flow, the more you're mixing the genes, creating a common gene pool. Um, and the main force behind population differentiation are mutations, genetic drift, and natural selection. Right? Those are the other three main forces of evolutionary, uh, evolutionary mechanisms. Um, the latter, natural selection, drives ad adaptation, particularly when species have a wide genetic basis, wide distribution range, and are exposed to extensive environmental geographic variability. It's just describing, like, these are the conditions in which natural selection does its best job of shaping organisms uh, for their current environment. In any case, the differenti for differentiation to occur, reduced gene flow is important. Yes, if you have constant gene flow between individuals, then it is difficult for any set of individuals to gain a particular unique combination of, of alleles, of, of variants, uh, and therefore different morphology and adapt to some new, to, to a, a, a localized uh, difference in that particular geographical region. Uh, and so high gene flow generally stops speed, well, it stops the process of divide, species dividing into multiple species. Uh, this paragraph is great. It basically just describes the mechanisms of, the, the interplay of mechanisms of evolutionary mm -hmm. mechanisms. All right, so then they're applying this to, we're in the introduction still, they're applying this to the, uh, the question of um, these specific, this specific species. Although the Gulf of Mexico is not very wide, about 200 kilometers at its widest point, and much less among islands, it is recognized as a geographical barrier for many terrestrial species on the Mexican Pacific coast. Plants and animal species derived from ancient populations living before and during the opening of the Gulf, in other words, before the Gulf cracked open, these two pieces of land were together. And, you know, populations were all, all over the place. And then it cracked open, and then some of those populations got stuck, separated from their, from their kin, right? right? From their, what used to be neighbors. Probably evolved in geographical isolation under new ecological, geological, and oceanographic determinants. Right on the Baja Peninsula, it is a different environment than on the mainland today. These factors led to a high percentage of endemism in the peninsula. Endemism means that's the only place where you find that species. And it's true, the, the, the Baja Peninsula has a whole bunch of unique species, a whole bunch of different cacti that only live on the Baja Peninsula. 
And it's thought that their ancestors are a common population that lived before that the, the Gulf split up, before the Gulf of California uh, was created. So this raises the question about organ pipe cactus. All right, there's a bunch of endemic species on the Baja Peninsula. What about the uh, organ pipe cactus? We see it on the Baja, but we also see it in Mexico. But maybe if we looked at their genetics, we'll find out they're actually separating. And maybe they're so different from one another that even though they look very similar, they might almost be new species. I've already given away the fact that they're really not new species. The, 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 Baja, the peninsular ones are not a new species. They are similar enough to the mainland ones that they clearly still are the same species. And why are they still the same species? Because there's gene flow, right? These particular species are finding a way to share their genetics with the mainland populations, whereas other small populations of other types of cacti um, that may have different types of pollinators that are not bats, right? These produce huge white, pinkish flowers up on the top of the organ pipes um, and they open at night and they are specialist for attracting bats. All right. But other cacti open at different times and they're more like beetles or other organisms, bees and so forth. And that's their pollinators uh, and their seed distributors are also different. And they're more local. And so therefore it's hard to get their genes to flow across 200 kilometers of, of open ocean. And therefore, the plants on the other side never get to benefit from that cross-pollination, and they become more different over time. So you have endemic species on the Baja Peninsula. And so this is a nice example showing how the different fort me evolutionary mechanisms under different ecological conditions can result in some, some populations becoming endemic new species, and other populations continue to share genetic information and don't become new species and just become simply populations of a larger species with a broader geographical range. The organ pipe cactus are the most widely distributed species in the mainland and the peninsula. The organ pipe cactus differs from the Sunita in being pollinated and dispersed by long distance flying vertebrates, in particular nectar feeding, the nectar feeding bat and several species of perching birds. All right, so birds as well, and birds can fly a long distance. So they have the type of pollinators that you would predict before you even do the study, right? Even before you go in and look at their genetics, you would predict that there's a, a high likelihood that there, you're going to find some gene flow. Uh, this feature makes the organ pipe cactus a suitable model to test the relative contributions of vicariance and geodispersal at its, um, in its evolution and in the evolution of columnar cactus bat mutualisms. All right, got a bunch of methods. Oh, the stars represent where the populations are that they looked at. So these are the places they sampled and, and get genetic variation from each of those populations. So multiple individuals from each of those populations to ask the question, how much genetic variation is there within populations? And then they're comparing the genetic variation between these different populations. And then they're asking, are there any, are there any patterns between the populations? You know, and you might expect like all the northern populations might be more similar than the ones down south. And maybe all the peninsular ones are all similar to one another and compare the ones across. Right. Those might be predictions you might make. Right. So you have a hypothesis uh, that's based on your understanding about gene flow and your observations about bats and where bats live and how they might migrate. And therefore you could predict like where the genes might be moving around between these populations. But then you need to actually go out and actually say like, we need to actually test it. Like, let's go out and sample these populations, look at their, their frequencies of alleles, and we can draw a genetic network and actually figure out these alleles have been moving from this location to that location to that location. And does that fit our projections? Um, okay, so we, let's skip way down here. Uh, they did a little test to look at, they, they sequenced a bunch of genes, uh, and then they look at that sequence, and then they look at the variations within those sequences. They're actually looking at protein coding genes, but they're looking at, var they're really looking at variants between those protein coding genes at neutral sites. Uh, and they do Tajima's uh, D test, which is just a statistical test to ask, if you look at all these populations, whether it looks like they are evolving or changing in their frequency due to natural selection. Is, is there something important about that variation that's being selected upon? Uh, and they show that 
the variations they're looking at in their populations in almost all the populations are neutral. Um, and that's important for their gene mapping network thing because um, they want to say these are just neutral changes. The, these are mutations that pop up and then they're just being passed on uh, by chance. Uh, and then they're being picked up and carried to other populations by gene flow. And all of this is not being um, strongly affected by natural selection. In other words, there isn't something about this variant that makes it so much better to, to be transported to another location or gives that population a much better survival rate, so therefore it's going to spread within the population faster than other uh, variants. And so I guess another way of putting this is all these variants relative to each other are just as important. And so there isn't any reason to believe there's a bias uh, for one variant over another. So when you see the distribution of variants in one population, um, you can you can assume that their distribution is because of uh, the age of the population and uh, the amount of gene flow bringing things back and forth. They look at uh, different groupings of haplotypes, so different sets of variants that are common. So what you find is within a population, you might look at 30 individuals and 20 individuals all have the same mutations. It's all the same alleles, all the same variants. Right. That's a that's a haplo group. They, they follow each other. Right. So they must be all related to one another very, very closely. Uh, and then within that population, there might be another group that has, oh, these got like eight differences. Right. Uh, and so forth, because they have shared their chloroplast genome. They have their chloroplast genome was inherited from another individual that has given rise to this particular group. Uh, so you're tracing these different sets of variants that are moving within populations. I probably should explain since we're looking at chloroplast genomes, we're not talking about like um, diploid organisms that have two copies of the thing and they can be crossing over and mixing. We're talking about a chloroplast genome that has one circular genome and so that one circular genome gets past the next generation. So as they accumulate mutations, it's kind of like the mitochondrial genome in us. I have a certain haplotype, a certain set of variants in my mitochondrial DNA and then I'm, well I'm not sharing it because only females share it. but uh, my wife has a, a copy and she shared it with all our kids and all our kids probably have the same haplotype she does. And then if one of them has a mutation and they have mutations, they're going to create another set of new variants that will be a new haplotype um, that then gets passed down from generation to generation. And so you can create these networks of like back, moving back through time, looking at where did these different group, where did these different uh, variants arise and then how have they been spreading from one place to another through individuals in populations. Um, I oh, Let's see, let's not get bogged down in these figures other than to show you this millions of years thing down over here. Uh, on the left hand, I'm sorry, the right hand side, you've got this figure that shows uh, how old these populations are, right? So the core peninsular and the core mainland sequences uh, the peninsular sequences uh, have a lot of divergence between, there's a lot of different haplogroups over there. We're saying there's more genetic structure. Uh, they're, they're isolated from one another, um, and they have a little less gene flow uh, amongst each other uh, compared to the mainland ones. So even though the mainland ones might have separate, separate populations, they have more continuous population across that range, uh, allowing for more gene flow and therefore less genetic uh, structure. Uh, within those populations. But look at these ages. They're talking about these columnar um, cacti being uh, one to two million years old. And then there's another Stenoceros species, uh, which they consider to be about five million years old. So you have to go about, back to about five million years to find the common ancestor between these two different species in the same genus. And the columnar cacti in these populations, well, Really, I'm sorry, I misspoke. These aren't really populations, these are haplogroups. So within a population, you can have, like these individuals all have this type of mitochondrial genome, just like I have a particular mitochondrial genome, but other people have different mitochondrial genomes. But other ones who, sh yeah, other people who also have my mitochondrial genome have the same variants, we're all part of the same haplogroup. And we would, you know, we share an ancestor somewhere. Right? We all share a common ancestor, at least our mitochondrial DNA does, because we've all shared that set of variants. And so what they've done is they've extracted from all the populations the haplogroups that exist 
and then asked like where are these haplogroups and uh, all these individuals that have this particular haplogroup and how different are the haplogroups well it's just like mitochondrial dna how different are the haplogroups well the more variants you have the more differences you have that means the more mutations have accumulated the more mutations that this goes back to my introduction when I showed you another paper and I said what's probably in that paper is they sequence genes, they look at the number of variants, they count up the number of variants and they figure out the rate at which those variants are introduced into the population and they use it as a molecular clock to estimate how long it's been since you had a common ancestor between a haplogroup. And here you're seeing it. Here's a bunch of different haplogroups, distinct sets of sequences in, in chloroplast DNAs. And you have to go back about 2 million years to find a common ancestor, a place in time in which there was one chloroplast genome with one haplogroup. These are all the variants that exist. This is the particular set of variants that existed at that time. There was only one set. They were all the same in that population. And then they had mutations and made all these different haplotype groups. And these haplotype groups then have been being passed around through through gene flow between populations. And sometimes some populations have more of one haplotype than another. And that's how you get different structures within these populations. Uh, and that's where the pie charts come in and all that stuff shows you how many of these particular groups are in each one. What else did I wanna say? Uh, they do a bunch of other types of analyses to show that there's structural uh, genetic differences between populations on the peninsula and the continent and how the peninsula is different. But ultimately what they're trying to get at, and I don't think there's really a good figure that shows this, um, but ultimately I'll just park it right here. And for anyone who understands this stuff, you can read the, uh, you can read the figure legend. Ultimately what they wanna get at is they wanna show that uh, the haplogroups from the peninsula are being passed over to the southern portion of the Mexican distribution. And then sometimes the mainland uh, haplogroups that are rare there are being moved over the peninsula. And then they show the bat distribution. Oh, I think that is in here. And skim down here. Yes, they're actually showing um, um, the direction in which the, the bats are moving genes back and forth across this area. This figure over here just shows uh, at one time of the year, the air is the, the, the main jet stream. Um, well, not the jet stream. The, the, the airflow at, uh, you know, a, a thousand feet below uh, is moving across and that allows the bats to catch that wind and get over to the other side. And then at another six months later, the wind direction actually is reversed. And that's the time in which the bats take advantage of that and come to the other side and come back over to the Baja. Uh, and so that fits the, uh, the wind pattern cycle as well. So it's interesting, you know, in this paper, they, they sort of collect a bunch of information from lots of different fields in science in order to form a, a collective picture of what's been happening to these plants. But those plants are dependent on bats and the bats are dependent on the climatic conditions and the weather patterns. Right? It all fits together. And so a change in any one of those things, it will change, will have an effect on these cacti in the future. Uh, one other little tidbit from this paper, and then I want to talk about its um, relevance to the question of, you know, how old are these cacti and, and how all of this makes the young earth, the, those who believe that all of these cacti are populations are less than 4,000 years old, makes that whole thing seem rather ridiculous. Um, this figure is the ecological niche modeling, all right? Predicted environmental suitability. And so here they're using um, uh, environmental factors, soil, weather patterns, right? Soil moisture, uh, temperatures, and so forth to predict where you might find um, columnar cacti or the organ pipe cactus, right? And so this green area is the theoretical area where they can exist. And it's really close to where they actually do exist, all right? So, and so this is somebody who models it. And then you go out in the real world and you say like, hey, this model in this real world have like a 85% match. That's really good. And like I said, there can just be areas where they maybe just haven't gotten to yet. Or maybe they've been extirpated, right? through some other activity, or maybe there's some rare other species that has outcompeted them in one area where they, where they seem like they should be competitive, but they're not. 
Now, there's three figures here. Um, the top one, oh yeah, this is current, right? So this is their current distribution, predicted distribution, which very much overlaps with their actual current distribution. Um, you can see there's a slight bit of a habitat up in California that's suggested as a uh, potentially viable habitat, but there aren't any there. All right, so probably in the Ice Age, they may have been there in the past, but they got wiped out through the Ice Age because it wouldn't have been suitable habitat. And then as they've moved north since the Ice Age, they have managed to find their way over there. That's pretty far away from their current habitat, so they'd have to distribute there and they'd have to establish themselves there. Maybe they will someday. Um, and then what you have here is in B, you've got the last glacial maximum, right, which is 21,000 years ago. And then down here you have from 100,000 years ago, which would be the last interglacial period, which would be a glacial period, uh, which is the last time it was warmer, all right, or fairly warm again. And so here they're showing like a long, long time ago, before the last ice age, all right, during the last time there was a more hospitable environment, but not as warm as it is today, we find that here's their habitat, right, fairly limited. Um, and so this is where they might have been before. And then you come up here and you say, well, like, now you got the Ice Age. Well, what happened in the Ice Age was the habitat got pushed farther south. And basically it looks like the entire peninsula was uninhabitable, right? Or maybe very, very small locations, not much room for them to survive. And therefore they might have been wiped out 21,000 years ago. And then they're only, they, so they have a rel, what we'd call a relict population. That relict population would have been in here in, in Mexico, far south of where they're at now. And now they have spread out across their range as their range has expanded as the earth has warmed since the last glacial uh, maximum. And they've also probably dispersed back across the peninsula so bats have carried seeds over to the other side of the peninsula, over to the peninsula, and they've reestablished themselves there to create populations. Uh, and so over the last 20,000 years, they then have produced populations on the peninsula that then have accumulated mutations uh, and they're more isolated there. And so there's like pockets of different genetic variation on the, on the peninsula. All right, before I, before I get to my, my last topic, I forgot I was going to show you the relationship of the organ bite cacti and the columnar cacti to other cacti, to the cactaceae. There's a, a family of plants called the cactaceae. Um, and so let's go to this paper here, phylogenetic relationships, how cacti related to one another, the evolution of growth form in cactaceae um, by Arturo de Nova et al in the in the journal american journal of botany from 2011 and we just need to go down to a couple figures here right they sequenced a whole bunch of genes from these and they're looking at the relationships of all these so they're showing uh all the, well you have the opunt opuntioidae right which are like your your prickly pear cacti um and then there's the the group of the traditional cactae which is a subfamily. So there's a whole bunch of subfamily and that's not the one we care about. And then you've got your like barrel type cacti, right there in the, where there's the cactase to the cactae uh, subfamily. Uh, and then we go down to, we find out that if we break out another group, we find we have this entire group here, which includes this thing right here, D, well actually A. <laughs> Uh, and A is what? I gotta remember what A is. I've forgotten now. Oh, Stenoceros uh, pruinosis. All right, and Stenosis is the same genus. So this is a this is an organ pipe cactus uh, relative. Uh, and where are those? Here's our guy right here. Oh yeah, this is Prunosis right here. All right, they don't actually have the species that we're looking at. So we have Stenoceros, 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 and a couple other genera in here uh, that may or not, may or may not actually be different genera uh, based on this analysis. Uh, and our particular species is not included in this, but presumably it would be included in this group here, right? In, in terms of their genetic relatedness and their similarity in terms of morphology, because that's what this paper is about, is looking at different growth types. 
And so all these different growth types in this one genus. But you can see there's a bunch of other different genera here uh, that make other different things. And one of them is uh, Carnegie. I'm pretty sure that's in here somewhere. Mm. Yeah, I, you know, I really did look up this before, but now, oh, here we go. Here's Carnegie Gigantia, uh, and that is the saguaro. All right, so just to give you an idea of like, there's all these other different genera, and then these genera are connected to one another by common ancestors. Uh, and this is, in this case, we're looking at um, their genes are connected together. together. Um, but they're not a, exactly what we call a sister genus to the, to the columnar cacti, all right, to the, the organ pipe cactus. So they look kind of similar, but there's dozens of other species and other genera which are more similar than they are to each other. Nonetheless, the overall growth type of all these cacti are very similar. Now, let me, I want to relate this to um, the question of young earth creationism. Like what does a young earth creationist do when they see something like this? Like how, how should they accommodate this kind of data? They were like, well, what about, well, what are you talking about with young earth creationists? I'm, what I'm saying here is um, usually you hear about animals, but let's talk about plants with them. Um, young earth creationists believe the world's only 6,000 years old and God created all the different kinds of organisms, kinds of plants, kinds of fungi, kinds of animals on uh, the six days of creation. So only 6,000 years old. All right, so each different kind of organism is separately created. Now, you can ask, what is a kind? And for most creationists now, they say, like, all canines, dogs, wolves, coyotes, foxes, they're all one kind. And therefore, they accept that one kind of organism can diversify and change and evolve into multiple different species that have similar forms. So now, what do they do with plants? They actually do the same type of thing with plants. They say, like, you've got uh, maybe God created one kind of cactus, and then the cactus became all of these different kind of cacti over the last 6,000 years. Like maybe all the barrel cacti, maybe all the opuntia type cacti, uh, and maybe all the columnar uh, type cacti. Or maybe they might say, well, like, well, maybe only just the columnar cacti. Maybe God created a columnar-like cactus and then allowed it to change and evolve into lots of different species. Um, now, this paper should make you realize that that's uh, quite a stretch, right? Because I've just shown you one species, right? One fairly widespread species. There are dozens of other stenoceros recognized species that are genetically distinct from that and they don't interbreed with each other. Um, so either God created every single species of Stenoceros separately, and he did that at the beginning, 6,000 years ago. Then they had to survive in a world that most creationists don't believe had deserts for the first 1,500 years. And yet these are incredibly adapted to desert environments. Um, and uh, I mean, everything about their lifestyle is about uh, reducing herbivory and preserving water, uh, both of which wouldn't have been necessary in the original creation, according to Young Earth Creationist. So then they, if they were created, if God created multiple different species of Stenoceros and multiple hundreds of different species of columnar cactus, and they all had to survive to the point of Noah's flood, and the Noah's flood covered the entire world, and somehow they all survived. Right, all those different species somehow made it through. Like maybe there were seeds that floated in the water. You could make some kind of argument that they, you know, pieces of the plant survived. And then in the new world, after the waters receded, they began to grow. Now, you have to know that the one thing is really important to know about the cacti is that out of the 3,000 some species of cacti in the world, 99.99% um, of them live in North America and South America. There is only one species of cactus that has been found anywhere else in the world, and it's in Africa, and that clearly is, a lot of studies have been done on it. It's pretty clearly an export from South America to Africa uh, since humans have done that. So if there was thousands of species of cacti that got swallowed up in this global flood, this is a weird distribution pattern. This is a very difficult thing for young earth, to, young earth creationists to explain. Why did all the cacti, of the, all the things that we call in this family the cactaceae, but for young earth creationists might be 3,000 different created things, why did every single one of them show up just in North America and South America? And why, like all the stenoceros, 
they're only found in central Mexico, all right, and southern U.S., right? All the species, they're all found just in that one area. It looks like there was one type of Stenoceros that then has been separated into separate populations, has become different species. But what I've just shown you is a paper where we're looking at one species and we're showing that that one species has been around for a long time. I mean, they estimate it's been around for a couple thousand million years, just this one species. Um, but even if we grant that, okay, your molecular clock numbers are wrong and they really have not been around that, these are long-lived organisms uh, that live hundreds of years. Uh, and they're, they, they, it's hard for them to establish a new, a new plant. Uh, and they don't move very quickly. And young earth creationists believe that there was an ice age. They believe there's an ice age just 4,000 years ago. So they would also have to look at these maps of uh, distribution maps of where the niche was and say that, you know, these plants probably didn't even live north of central Mexico just 4,000 years ago, which means they had to all have migrated up into the Sonoran Desert over just the last couple thousand years. And they have to migrate over to the peninsula and produce these populations. And they not only that, as they did that, they would have to have the, all the mutations they've had in order to have all the different haplotypes that they have today. If they started out as just a few individuals after the flood. And so their distribution, their genetic, um, the, the, the amount of genetic variation they have, the way the genetic variation is distributed into pockets, uh, all makes sense within the context of them living in this area for tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of years and being ecologically adapted to these particular bats, right? And these bats, they're producing particular types of flowers for, right? All those things in, take a lot of time for natural selection to develop those particular relationships. If young earth creationists want to say that Stenoceros was just one thing that God created, like one kind, and then all of the different species came from that, well, then they're going to have to say that after the flood, because there are no fossils of, of cacti in the flood, right? It appears that all cacti are some that it were formed after the flood somehow. Um, the cacti, um, I got to put a parenthesis on what I just said. Some creationists would say that some fossils of some cacti are from flood layers, but it depends on where they believe the flood layers are. This just boggles the mind uh, that this much genetic variation could form within all these different species. Because I've just shown you the genetic variation in just a few little sections of a very small portion of the genome of Stenoceros. And there's many other species that are very, very different species. And that all that genetic variation would have to be formed in order for them to have developed into different species. But it looks like Stenoceros has been around as Stenoceros for a very long time. I mean, Stenoceros looks like it's been around since the Ice Age, which means it, the way it looks today, is basically the same as it's been for the last 4,500 years. So I don't see any evidence that there's been rapid ev evolution of dozens of new species of Stenoceros in the last 4,000 years. Um, all the harmocks, all the things about these species being slow growing, gene flow is actually, you know, even though I've shown there's gene flow, we're not talking about genes flowing back and forth every single year and all these populations being, but we're talking about thousands of years of individual haplotypes having a chance, one, a, a one in a million chance of making it across. And maybe every 10 years, maybe every 100 years, maybe even every thousand years, there is a, a, a crossing of some pollen and of seed across that 200 uh, kilometer barrier. Uh, but within the evolutionary context, every 100 years, that's enough. That's enough gene flow to keep the populations mixed together enough to keep them the same species, right? The younger races don't have that much time. They need gene flow to, to occur at incredible rates in order to keep these species you know, uh, the, the same. They also need incredible rates of mutations. They need incredible rates of, of natural selection. They need, they need all kinds of things to occur for them to make a lot of species um, out of this. So I kind of show this paper to, to show a tiny bit of the nuts and bolts of the reality of how long the processes of genetic mechanisms of change 
uh, you know, need to have to occur. Um, as the environment changes, the new habitats open up. It's going to take hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years for for these cacti to even move, you know, another 50 miles or 100 miles north. It just takes a lot of time. These are slow growing things uh, that don't go through a lot of generations. And that's another problem, right? You, young earth creationists need lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of generations to have the amount of natural selection, the amount of genetic drift, and the amount of, of uh, new mutations occur for them to get all the different kinds of variants that we see in today's environment. So there's a lot of issues. There's a lot of like curious puzzles for young earth creationists whenever you look at groups like this. And these are things that typically aren't talked about. Um, young earth creationists, uh, you, there's just only a few dozen total articles on plant evolution. Like what is the origin of plants and how do they survive the flood and where does their diversity come from? Um, but plants are immensely diverse and this this crushes something like okay well there's 35 different living species of canines and they would like to say that they're all the same thing they all came from a common ancestor on the ark but then when you look at the cactaceae and i do know that there are some creationists who say that well the cactaceae all have similar features they're all one family and a family is like a kind so maybe god created one kind of cactus but then if you say that you're saying you know, young earth creation is saying that all of these species, all of these species and all these different forms, and all of these different species and all the different forms, all living only in North and South America, mostly adapted to the desert, but some are adapted to tropical uh, locations. And many of them having some kind of record of having been around for thousands of years in the exact same look and condition they're in today. And yet somehow all of this diversity came from just a few individuals and all this diversity survived the flood but only survived it and managed to f only establish themselves in north and south america after the flood these are just mind-bending uh it, i just i can't even it's hard for me to even come up with a crazy wild scenario to explain this that seems at I can't even think of an improbable scenario <laughs> to even suggest to you that would somehow fit into the Young Earth Creationist timeline. Um, this is just yet another example of things that I see every day and that I think that um, people that are doing research uh, as scientists and biologists see every day that when they hear Young Earth Creationists talk about genetic variation, and, oh, well, you know, this thing could have just become these 50 species. Uh, because they had some genetic variation that just uh, got sorted out uh, in, in a few generations. That's just, it's just ridiculous, right? There's no um, evidential, there's no uh, observational support for that. Well, there's no theoretical support for that. There's no modeling of genetics that supports that. All right. Yeah, what else was I going to say? Was there anything else I was going to cover? I can't remember. All right, I'm not going to go back to the paper. Uh, we'll just we'll just leave it right here. Okay, I think that's it. I'm just going to leave it right there. My dogs are about to go. Well, there they go. They're starting to bark. So I'm going to say goodbye. We'll talk to you later. <laughs>